Um, the Holocaust on trial. And uh, we'll have the next picture, please. So here are the various people. Now, I have to explain something that's very crucial to this whole thing. It's backwards from American law. I'm not that familiar with Canadian law with lawsuits, but I'm pretty sure in Canada we do the same thing. Deborah Lipset is the defendant. If this same trial took place in the United States, certainly, and probably in Canada, David Irving would be the defendant. So the plaintiff is the person in British law that was defamed, David Irving, and the publisher, Penguin Books, and Deborah Lipset is the defendant. And we had Richard Rampton, QC, on the defense team. And the judge was Justice Charles Ray. And you will see he wore the uh, traditional wig. And we'll have the next picture, please. Anthony Julius was the personal counsel for Deborah Lipset. Christopher Browning was, can we just go back? Christopher Browning was the key defense witness. He wrote a book that uh, we'll see later. Uh, he's not Jewish. He teaches at Chapel Hill and I think it's North Carolina. And I have a funny, not a funny story, but an interesting story about him when I heard him lecture. Richard Evans, he discredited Irving's research. And Robert Van Pelt, who we had speak at Beth Sholem, Robert Van Pelt testified against Irving. And we'll have the next picture, please. Sir John Keegan is a reluctant witness for Irving. He was a historian. Uh, Donald Cameron Watt was also a reluctant witness for Irving. Fred Luchter, they used to call him Dr. Death. He had an idea that no one was ever gassed and the whole thing was a myth. So he was a he was a witness for the prosecution. Remember, David Irving is prosecuting Deborah Lipset and Penguin Books, and Kevin, Kevin McDonald's an anti-Semitic witness for the prosecution. And we'll have the next slide, please. Here's Deborah Lipset. So let me just take you to the time and place. It's the dawn of the 21st century. It's a new century. January 11, 2000, all rise, the clerk shouts, and David Irving versus Penguin Books Limited and Deborah Lipsa. It's a typical gray winter morning in London. The courtroom is packed not only with people, including participants and spectators, but also with the accoutrements of the rainy season. Uh, it was in London once in the winter. It's always seemed to be raining, and it's gray all the time. So people brought hats, raincoats, and umbrellas. And the next picture, please. And here's David Irving. Um, and he is suing. He, again, is the plaintiff. He is suing Evelitsa. And we have the next picture, please. And it's a typical rainy day in London. And the next picture, please. And the audience, Hasidic men, Nazi skinheads, we had a whole variety of things. There were quite a few uh, Orthodox people and ultra-Orthodox people at the trial. I'm sure many of them had relatives who were killed in the Holocaust and so forth. So Justice Charles Gray, he walks rather briskly to the center of a raised dais with a long wooden bed, and he looks the part. He's wearing black silk robes, a scarlet sash, a white tie, and a pewter colored wig. Now, as I mentioned, there's this variety of Nazi skinheads, quite a mixed audience, uh, some Orthodox, some non-Orthodox, a lot of Jews, and so forth. There are very many wealthy Jews who were supporters of Deborah Litsatz. Let's have the next the slide, please. And thank you again. And a lot of Holocaust survivors were there. It was 20 years ago. 
it's a, it's a terrible thing to contemplate. In another 10 years, I would guess, we will have no Holocaust survivors. Well, there were, a lot of them were there, and some of them had the blue number tattoo. She had a tremendous uh, support. Uh, there was the English and foreign press. All of them had their Blackberries and other technical devices. And there were simply common folks who came in and walked in. This was a very high profile libel case. And there are also um, a tremendous interest from everywhere. And we'll have the next picture, please. And this is where it took place, the Royal Court of Justice. Now, you would have thought that a British court inside would look sort of like the outside, but it was nothing like that. The courtroom was a crisp, white, modern chamber, lawn wood furniture, and all the high-tech paraphernalia of modern litigation. There were fluorescent lights, microphones were hanging everywhere. Uh, you could not televise or take pictures uh, in there, but, but uh, you had all this high tech. You had to be very careful where you step. Uh, there was a complex of cables connecting all the laptops and so forth and so on. Tremendous modern technology. And uh, outside of the building, and we can see it here, it really conveyed British justice. The courthouse was the Royal Court of Justice building. It's a Victorian Gothic structure, elaborate vaults, carved stonework, and towering spires. The Royal Courts of Justice stood where Fleet Street intersects the Strand. And people have commented that that intersection, that's where journalism and the theater meet. It was really, truly an apt location for this trial. And we have the next picture, please. And this is Richard Rampton, uh, QC, a top libel lawyer, and he's for the defense. Um, so the defense, again, is Deborah Lipsack and Penguin Publishing. Richard Rampton is a barrister. Apparently, there are two levels of lawyers in Britain. Barristers are the superior lawyer who goes to court, and solicitors are kinds of people that prepare wills and and paperwork and so forth. And Brampton, as the custom in Britain, he wears a short gray blonde wig and silk robes. And you could tell he was a Queen's Counsel. I think it has the same deference as here. And we'll have the next picture, please. Here we see Deborah Lipsat. Uh, she is personally represented by this legal firm. Uh, which is also representing Penguin Books. And these are some of the other people on her defense. Heather Rogers was Rampton's assistant. She wore black robes. Anthony Julius, I mentioned before, the personal counsel for Lipsat. She wore a plain black robe, no wig. David Irving had launched his libel suit against Deborah Lipsat because he didn't want to have the expense, so he defended himself. He had no counsel. He was not a man of a great deal of money, not that he deserved to have any money. Uh, the managing editor and director of Penguin Books, Anthony Forbes Watson was also there, and there was a tremendous amount of lawyers. Now, in addition to the legal counsel, Deborah Lipsat, the professor from Memory University in Atlanta, she had a multitude of survivors. There were friends from Atlanta, officials from the American Jewish Committee, the Board of Deputies of British Jewish Jews, the Anti-Defamation League of Bene Brith, and Steven Spielberg. Do we have the next picture, please? He wasn't there, but he certainly sent a great donation. And as I mentioned, Irving acted as his own counsel. And the next picture, please. How did David Irving look? He wore uh, half spectacles. He came to court wearing a $2,000 made to measure Reeves and Hawk chalk striped suit. I don't know uh, British clothing, but probably a top firm. Despite his attire, 
and his demeanor, uh, Irving was not a wealthy man. And again, I want to explain a libel action in England is completely different from that of America. And perhaps someone could tell me, uh, I'm pretty sure Canadian law is the same as American law in this regard. So Irving had launched this action in England rather than America because he would have had to have lawyers and so forth. Deborah Lipsatz had denounced Irving as a Holocaust denier and a falsifier of history. We have to understand that David Irving, he made his living writing books. Most of them were pro-German and tried to make the slant that Hitler knew nothing about the Jews being killed and so forth. And I want to stop and digress for a moment as I have to do. I have to tell you, when we moved from our house many years ago, we, we put out all kinds of things on our garage sale. And if you've ever had a garage sale, what happens is early in the morning, uh, people who know something show up. So about eight o'clock in the morning, we're getting everything ready, all these books. And this guy pulls up with a car and he looks at the books and he grabs, he says, how much for the books? I wanted to get rid of all these hardcover books. It was a book by David Irving, I didn't realize. And <clears throat> I said a dollar, he gave me the dollar. And he says, he says, just lost a fortune. I says, how is that? He says, David Irving has now become a Holocaust denier. And this book he wrote about the hunt for Germans, rocket scientists, did not portray him in the same light. So it was very interesting. He made this statement, David Irving, more women died in the back seat of Edward Kennedy's car than ever died in Auschwitz. Very hard to take. It would have been almost impossible for Irving to win a libel case in America. And in England, and I think I've underscored this already, but the plaintiff, David Irving, has to prove three points. Firstly, that the words in question were published. Secondly, that the second here. Secondly, that the words referred to the claimant, in other words, that Deborah, I'm sorry, that David Irving was being referred to, the, the claimant. And lastly, the words exposed the alleged victim to hatred, contempt, or ridicule. So again, the burden of proof is on the defendant, Deborah Lipset. And next picture, please. Okay, so here we have the whole thing. I think I've beaten this to death. We all understand uh, what happened. And the next picture, please. And this is the logo of Penguin Books. Now, Penguin Books had uh, published this book that Deborah Lipsatz had written that allegedly, at this point it's still allegedly, had defamed David Irving. Now, they could have quit, and we have to give kudos to the Penguin books people because they supported her. It was an enormous case. Deborah Lipset was under enormous pressure, both factual and financial. An early estimate of the fees from Anthony Julius, her personal lawyer, it was going to be over a million pounds. So even 20 odd years ago, that would have been a million and a half American dollars, a huge sum today. There was an additional question, whether or not the publisher Penguin Books would stand behind it. And you know, most large corporations, they want to back out, they don't want to be in court. And it would have been easy for Penguin Books to simply settle out of court and leave Deborah Lipsat with wolves, but they didn't do that. And Irving had counted on that. He didn't realize that he was going to be in this costly and time consuming action. Now, I, I want to emphasize Irving had published quite a few military histories, uh, sort of soft peddling the Holocaust, completely denying it, and talking about some other things and so forth. Well, in the end, principle and right won over the financial costs. Penguin Books stood behind Deborah Lipset and assisted her in every possible way. Richard Rampin, their chief counsel, was the best. He was a veteran of many similar libel actions. He was very high profile. He had acted for Princess Diana when 
she had her divorce action against the principal whales. Lipsat gets a tremendous amount of monetary support. And let's have the next picture, please. The whole American Jewish community, uh, Rabbi Herbert Friedman, he was one of the first rabbis into the camps after they were liberated. Uh, Leslie and Abigail Wexner, Steven Spielberg, William Lowenberg, and many other Holocaust survivors, many people in the American Jewish community contributed, many diverse groups. Steven Spielberg, Shoah Foundation, uh, B'nai B'rith, and so forth. Everybody recognized in the Jewish community and all our supporters in the non-Jewish community, this was not about Lipset, but it was about the truth of the Holocaust. A Holocaust denier like David Irving simply could not be allowed to peddle his nefarious wares. And we'll have the next picture, please. Well, we know who this is. Uh, one of the points that Irving had made was that Adolf Hitler knew very little and had never written, issued a written order for the Holocaust. That actually is true. Hitler had written as far back as 1923 when he was imprisoned for the attempted coup in Munich by Bavaria, Germany, he had written about killing Jews. It was his absolute life goal. He had three goals. People call it his Weltstung, which is German for his worldview. His worldview, Hitler's worldview was kill all the Jews, destroy Judea Bolshevism, because in his twisted mind, communism, Bolshevism was Jewish, and create Lebensraum to the east. So we all know what Hitler's thought was, but technically it is true that there is no written order from Hitler ordering the Holocaust. Uh, when I took my courses in the Holocaust studies at the University of Toronto, people have found some written orders that other German officials had, had done. And if you attended the Adolf Eichmann trial and capture, we know that Adolf Eichmann uh, took minutes at that famous Wannacy conference. And I'm going to mention that movie again, I'm sorry, on uh, HBO, uh, The Conspiracy, about the Wannacy conference. If you want to really understand the Holocaust, I think there's no uh, awful effects in it, but it's awful just observing how the Germans behaved in that meeting. Irving had a lot of at stake. He had developed a reputation as a military historian. He had written a series of highly successful accounts of the Second World War, most of them somewhat sympathetic to Hitler and the Nazis. Irving states that Hitler knew nothing about the Holocaust, and he further, Irving further alleges that very few Jews were actually murdered at Auschwitz. And we'll have a picture again. Next one. Auschwitz. I have to also, I'm sorry, I'm going to intersperse my thoughts with a few personal comments. A number of years ago, it's about 25 years ago, I happened to be on a bicycle ride. I used to be quite athletic. I was on a bicycle ride. My wife had gone to uh, a skating competition in San Francisco, and I didn't want to stay home, so I took a bicycle trip in the south. And we ended up in this gorgeous plantation called Nottaway, maybe 100 miles from New Orleans. And one morning, it was still foggy. It was very hot. Uh, one morning, I got up, and I went for a walk. And I saw a sign and a path in this beautiful uh, plantation. And the path and the sign said, this way to the slave's quarters. I went down to the slave quarters and I stood there in absolute shock because the bunks, I said to myself, I have been to Auschwitz twice as thank God a uh, tourist. Uh, I looked at these bunks and I said, I've seen this somewhere before. This is Auschwitz. At any rate, Irving had already been banned, and we can take credit. He had been banned by the time of his trial in Canada, but he travels the world. He's collecting fees and spewing his venom. 
So this is not just about his relation, but it's his standing, it's his income as a so-called historian. Now the defense begins to prepare its strategy and several key factors become apparent. Lipsatz had to be kept out of the limelight. She was not to be called as a witness, nor was she allowed to speak to the press. She had very good legal counsel. And you can imagine this trial was so high profile coming and going to linen out of the courtroom was going through like a gauntlet of attackers, the press and the paparazzi, they swarmed everywhere, sticking microphones in front of people and they harangued all the trial participants for any tidbit of information. Rampton and Julius, the two key people on the defense team, they put an iron muzzle on Lipsack. Now, if you've heard, I've heard her speak in person, she's extremely well-spoken, very articulate, but she's to have no contact with the press. The entire focus was to be on Irving, and he had rather a loose tongue. It was strongly felt by the defense team, eventually Irving would hang himself with his fabrications. Parallel to this strategy, they were going to have no Holocaust survivors. Don't forget this was the year 2000. It's 55 years since the war ended at this point. And most Holocaust survivors probably who knew something, who experienced not as children, but were young adults or teenagers, they were already 75 or 80 years old. So they didn't want a Holocaust survivor testifying. And I went a couple of times, and remember we in Toronto put a Hungarian restaurant owner, I think it was called the Hungarian Village, Imre Pinta, on trial. And at that time, uh, my drugstore was at the Eaton Center, so I used to walk over to the trial. And the way they attacked the Holocaust survivors that were there was just awful to be seen because that it was so old. So they didn't want any Holocaust survivors to be brutally cross-examined and so forth. And next picture, please. Remember this man, uh, we had several trials involving him and his Holocaust denier. He was eventually extradited to Germany and he passed away. But the, again, the cross-examination witnesses in his trial was very brutal. So, and I still remember one of the lawyers, James Keekstra, I think was his name. So they didn't want the Holocaust survivors. They were afraid that someone would have a memory lapse or mix up some small fact and so forth. There were many pleas, numerous volunteers, but they would call no survivors. Deborah Lipsat was subject to a great deal of advice how the case should be conducted. A lot of the survivors, as she went by, they clasped her hands and they stared into her eyes and they told her, she is fighting for them. Some in the Jewish community, especially in Britain, they were upset with the case. I think British Jews are not quite as strong in their uh, defense of Israel and other things as I think we are in Canada and the United States. Some upper class British Jews felt the case should have been settled or dropped. They thought it would harm the Jewish case. The defense was going to use several key witnesses. They were carefully assembled. And the next picture, please. I have to again digress. Christopher Browning, if you take any Holocaust course at the university, this book, Ordinary Man, is a textbook you have to read. The book is about the Einsatzgruppen and what the Einsatzgruppen were, were there were four battalions following the main German army. And well, this is with the German invasion of the Soviet Union. And as the army penetrated the Soviet Union, these battalions of men, there were four of them, went behind and their job to shoot 
crews. They assembled them into pits or ravines like Baba Yar they were responsible for. 30,000 people were killed in one long weekend at Baba Yar, which is just out of the side of what is now Kiev. So uh, I, I'm just going to digress. You know, lecturers, uh, I want to tell a little story about uh, Christopher Browning. Well, he is a terrific person, well-spoken. I've heard him in person. His book is tremendous. At any rate, he comes and he was talking about a new book that he was working on. And the book was about the slave camp. And the conditions were horrendous. It wasn't the death camp, but many people were simply dying or beaten to death or shot at random. But it wasn't an extermination camp like the six we named uh, previously, Auschwitz. Madonek, Kalmo, Belzac, uh, Treblinka, and so forth. So anyways, Christopher Browning is telling the audience that these conditions were terrible, people were dying. And then a well-dressed woman, a very matronly, well-dressed woman, all but back to this huge lecture, because Christopher Browning is the name, she asks a question. And she obviously looked like she was one of the sponsors of the event. And she said to Christopher Browning, it's the worst question I've ever heard in my life as a lecturer. She said to Christopher Browning, well, I don't understand, Dr. Browning, if these Jewish people in the camp were so maltreated and dying and so forth, why didn't they leave and go to another labor camp? Well, Christopher Browning, to his credit, he knew he was dealing with somebody important, and he stood there with his mouth open for a few moments, and he says, I guess it wouldn't have been possible. And that was the end. So sometimes there are questions that are really bad. Uh, by the way, we should mention, he made it very clear that very few of these Einsatz with these ordinary men, and that's what they were. They were painters, they were plumbers, they were people that didn't exactly qualify for the main German army. And here they are shooting thousands of people a day. Um, so he, he called them ordinary men. Very few opted out. You could opt out with no penalty. So, you know, you don't want to shoot Jewish people today, go do something else. Very few opted out. There's another issue that we should talk about with respect to this. For a long time after the Holocaust, especially after Eichmann was trialed and captured, and I mentioned that uh, as a result of Eichmann's trial and capture of the explosion of Holocaust literature, very little before 1960, uh, at any rate, it was very difficult for these men to constantly shoot. I mean, not that we should feel sorry for them. That's why they had the conference at Wannesee, because they could see they had already murdered perhaps a million Jews by these mass shootings, but they couldn't go on. They had to have a more efficient way, and it was too public. Okay, so let's have the next picture. Richard Evans is one of the most distinguished experts on the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. He wrote many highly acclaimed books and he was going to be a defense witness. And then Robert Ben Pelt. And again, I'm going to... Robert Ben Pelt, I had him speak at Beth Sholem maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. Robert Ben Pelt, he's Dutch or... Uh, he spoke, he spoke at Beth Tikva, where I was quite a number of years ago. He's, Obviously, British. He's blonde. He's blue eyes. As we had a big debate after his talk, and someone got up and said, "This is one of my most embarrassing things that ever happened." This person, got, um, you know, if you were a member of the tribe, meaning if you were Jewish. You would think of commenting on something. It was very, very embarrassing because but Robert Van Pelt is a real man. And she says, but I have to stop you and tell you, I am Jewish. So I've told you about several embarrassing 
uh, things. And Pell is a professor of architecture and so forth. Uh, he made, he's the foremost expert on the architecture, infrastructure, and mechanics of Auschwitz. So Lipsat's defense team has put the group of the most high profile and expert authorities on the Holocaust. And then we had prosecution. We'll have the next picture, please. These are uh, a couple of, of witnesses for David Irving. He had, Irving had what he called the support of two prominent British historians, John Keegan, a military expert, and Donald Cameron Watt. Uh, both of these historians had written favorable reviews of Irving's book. Neither of them had wanted to come voluntarily. So Irving had them subpoenaed. What he found Irving's version of Hitler's personality and knowledge of the Holocaust very difficult to accept, but he, was, he said Irving had a different point of view, which was we have to listen to. I don't think we have to listen to that. Irving calls another witness, an American professor of psychology at California State University named Kevin McDonald. We'll have Kevin's picture. This man had the chutzpah to say that Jews brought all, all of this on themselves. How he could say Jewish misfortune is all caused by Jews. It was so grotesque. Rampton, the chief defense counsel, he said, I'm not even going to cross examine any of these people. Another witness for Irving was the journalist Peter Mueller. His testimony revolved around a defense charge that Irving had stolen a series of glass plates that contained portions of Goebbels' diaries from the Russian archive in Moscow. Now, I've done some archival research, and the one thing you're not even supposed to take a pen into some of these places, you would do so a pencil and paper. So for Irving to actually take stuff out of the archive, something like Goebbels' diaries would be awful. So they had quite a fight about that. And then the next, oh no, it's okay, you can have the next picture. This is the book that Irving wrote about Hitler and the prosecution of the war. John Keegan is the defense editor of the Daily Telegraph, a conservative newspaper in Britain. He appears. And he actually was Sir John Keegan. He had been given a knighthood by the Queen. So Irving is using him as a prosecution witness. And Keegan said, well, I've never met Irving before. I've never spoken to him. I've never corresponded with him. And this wasn't a great auspicious beginning for Irving's prosecution testimony. Irving begins asking Keegan if he still had a high opinion of the book that we're showing, Hitler's War. And Irving had asserted, again, Hitler had no knowledge of the final solution and so forth. Keegan responded that some of the controversies were entirely bogus and he said, it's impossible for Hitler to have so little knowledge of the murder of Jews. And this is his own witness. And then he asserted it was absolutely perverse of Irving to state that Hitler didn't know as late as 1943 what was happening to Jews at war. Unfortunately, as we know, too many people knew and didn't do anything about it. Many in the courtroom felt that why Keegan did not did acknowledge the Holocaust, he didn't seem to accept the fact, and again, this was a contentious issue in Germany for many years, that the Wehrmacht, the ordinary German land army, participated in the Holocaust. We know now, and I do feel that the Germans are mainly contrite, that yes, 
we know now for sure that the regular German army, it wasn't just those Einsatzgruppen, it wasn't just the SS, the ordinary German soldier, many of them participated, not all. Uh, at any rate, from this point, the trial moves on to an examination of Auschwitz. And by this time, by the year 2000, Auschwitz has become a paradigm of the 20th century. If you want to symbolize genocide, the Holocaust, mass murder, you put up a picture of Auschwitz. Uh, having been as a tourist to Auschwitz twice, I think what staggers you the most when you see it is the enormity of it. This is an enormous place. A hundred thousand people were working there as slave laborers. Many of them were shot out of hand. Many of them were beaten to death. Many of them simply starved or died of disease. But that part of Auschwitz was a labor camp and the people were worked to death. Another part of Auschwitz, Birkenau, is where the extermination took place. Irving's challenge to normally accepted views of Auschwitz were based on Fred Lecter. And let's have a picture of Fred Lecter. Oh, here's Auschwitz. I think you can see in the picture, especially the one on the right, you can see this was a big place surrounded entirely by electrified uh, barbed wire. And the next picture, please. Here's Fred Lecter. And Fred Lecter, he became a star in a movie produced by the investigative journalist, Errol Morris. Now, Errol Morris is pro-Jewish, and he tried to expose Fred Lecter's nonsense. He was called Mr. Death. He was a chemist. He tried to prove that the levels of hydrogen cyanide, Cyclone B gas, incidentally, Cyclone B gas was made by the Bayer Corporation, the aspirin group. So he tried to prove that the levels on the residue left in the rubble of Auschwitz, don't forget the crematorium and so forth were blown up in a slave rebel, uh, uh, rebellion. Uh, he said there's not enough residue. We couldn't have killed all these people there. Following the trial, Irving joins forces with Ferrison. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Following the Zumbel trial, Irving had joined forces with Ferrison and Zumbel. They were also major Holocaust deniers. They tried to exploit the Lecter residue results to fabricate the idea that it could no, not have murdered all these people. There's just not enough residue of the chemical cycle on TGS left. Brampton, the head defense counsel, quickly rebutted the lecture evidence by showing the quantity of hydrogen cyanide necessary it was really very small. And the, the scale of murders at Auschwitz-Birkenau was at least as large as the Zyklon V uh, canisters had made it. Next, uh, we have an exchange between Rampton, Deborah Lipsatz's chief counsel, and Irving. Irving alleges that the gas chambers were not used to kill people, but they were used to fumigate corpses. Even the judge, who was a little bit incredulous at Irving's assertions, he, he, you could see he was quite disturbed. All during the trial, there's no jury, this is a judge, trial by judge. All during the trial, the judge has always noticed to be making numerous notes. There was a big courtroom debate between Rampton and Irving. Irving insisted that gas chambers were not gas chambers, but bomb shelters for the SS. Then we go back, next picture. Our friend Robert Van Pelt, who's an expert on the architecture and infrastructure of Holocaust, he takes the stand. And as it was an interesting point, as the court clerk began to swear him in, Brampton points out that Van Pelt wanted to use a Bible, a Bible to be sworn in by, because he's Jewish, he doesn't want to swear in on a Christian Bible. He said it had been in his family since before the war. So the judge asked, not in a bad way, he said, was it in English or Dutch? And the Van Pelt, we'll have the next picture, 
the Van Pelt Bible was the famous translation of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, but Martin Huber and Franz Rosenzweig. And it had been published in Germany in 1936. Three years after Hitler comes to power, the Van Pelt Bible belonged to his father, who took him into hiding when they escaped from the Nazis. Um, judging by the questioning, Irving was clearly not aware of Van Pelt's ethnic background. He also didn't think he was Jewish. And he cross-examines Van Pelt, and they go into incredible minutia talking about Auschwitz. And Irving questions every fact. He says there wasn't enough storage space for the coal, for coal to burn up the bodies. Uh, he said that these holes, and the holes became a huge thing. The holes that the gas was put through weren't there, and so forth. So big argument ensued also. How many inmates died of disease rather than being gassed to death? This is a favorite ploy of Holocaust deniers, claiming that the Jews of extermination camps died of disease. So I think it's going to be so important for us as Jews, as I mentioned earlier on, most of the Holocaust survivors are gonna be gone soon. And we have to understand the attacks that'll be made. And I suspect long after I'm gone and some of us are gone, that there's gonna be more attacks on the validity of the Holocaust. So Van Pelt and others proved that it was simply untrue. Hundreds of thousands were murdered in the gas chambers and later cremated. About a million one to a million and a half Jews were murdered at Auschwitz and cremated. Irving and Van Pelt keep squaring off about these Holocausts. Holes. The holes were the insertion points for the cyclone B gas pellets. Irving attempted to prove there were no such holes. And Van Pelt reminds the audience in the court that the Germans had blown up the crematorium after some of them were blown up by the inmates rebellion. So eventually the Russians liberate Auschwitz to some January the 27th, 1941. Uh, five. And at that point, uh, the SS and all the people that guarded had, had simply fled. Van Pelt proves that the facility at Auschwitz had aged badly over the 50 years since the crimes were committed. It was a difficult for the defense to tell the judge exactly what was going on. Very contentious and complex testimony. Um, then Pelt makes a very strong point, which really goes to the heart of conspiracy theories. He states in a forthright manner that there's an assumption the discovery of one little crack in, in an issue like this, like you can't find the holes and something like that, because the places have been blown up, that can't bring down the whole business. And if we think about I think one of the most contentious things, the Kennedy assassination, and I hope nobody disagrees with me. Unfortunately, I'm strong. I don't think there was any conspiracy. But if somebody finds some little thing, right away they make it into all conspiracy. So Van Pelt, I think, really got to the judge's mind with this, that one little diversion doesn't mean the whole thing falls down. Van Pelt's excuse, Rampton, resumes its cross-examination of the Irving. Slowly, carefully, Rampton begins to tear apart the historical accuracy that was the foundation of Irving's reputation. Time after time, he exposes Irving's testimony as out and out lies. Rampton points out numerous historical distortions, inaccuracies, and omissions. And this is how Irving had built his false reputation. And again and again, Rampton makes it out that Irving has fabricated a body of lies and that Irving is a liar. Rampton's sole goal at this point was to denigrate Irving, rip away whatever veneer of the academic reputation Irving had. 
He paints Irving as a liar and an incompetent historian. And we'll have the next picture, please. And here are the gas chambers at Auschwitz. And you can see how can anybody say that uh, these were uh, escape places for the SS because of the bombing? By the way, uh, the American British Air Forces had bombed very close to Auschwitz uh, at Monowitz, where there was a synthetic rubber uh, factory for the Nazis. They played a video of David Irving speaking to a rabid right-wing audience in Tampa, Florida. And in that, they showed how fanatical Irving was. Irving asserted the Jews were to blame for their own misfortune. And Irving said, if only the Jews had behaved differently over the last 3,000 years, then their fate would have been different. Rapid points to Irving sarcastically. That it's all the Jews' fault? Is that what you're saying? So Rampton, by his cross-examination, has cemented Irving as an anti-Semite. And all his theories are anti-Semitic. Rampton further goes on to paint David Irving as an appalling racist, discriminating against all minorities. And, and the next picture, please. There's the destruction of crematorium at Auschwitz. And this is when the Sunder Commandos had revolted in August 1944. Okay, and we'll have the next picture, please. I think it's fair to say by this point in the trial, Irving had been proven to be a liar by Brampton's cross-examination. Rampton excoriated Irving for teaching his little child poison. Step by step, Rampton continues to build the case of Irving as a historian who lied, distorted, he's a racist, and above all, he's an anti-Semite. And the next picture, please. This is some of the stuff that Irving wrote in a poem. I'm a baby Aryan, not Jewish or sectarian. I have no plans to marry an ape or arrest a fairy. This is the kind of stuff that this guy wrote. Uh, and he wrote this poem for his daughter. In the next picture, please. So Christopher Browning is next in the courtroom. And as I mentioned, tall, very, it was about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, very imposing professor from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And and because of his exemplary work and his landmark book, he is viewed as one of the world's greatest authorities on the Holocaust. In addition, Browning has testified at the Ernest Stumble trial. That trial, as I mentioned, that's why they didn't want to call any survivors as witnesses, because the witnesses, the Jewish Holocaust survivors, were badgered and abused terribly. Browning was well prepared for Irving's attack. Irving gets to cross-examine Browning, and he's forced to concede there was no explicit order from Hitler to exterminate the Jews. But it's common knowledge that Hitler, as I mentioned before, he didn't use written orders. It was his style simply to wave his hand. Irving attacks Browning for receiving a large grant from Yad Vashem, which he certainly deserves. And he says, well, you're an agent of Israel and you're for the Jews. Browning points out that on basis he was an agent of both the German and American governments as well, because he got the grants from the American and German governments. They had a terrific exchange. And I say that, I don't mean in a good way. Both people, Irving and Browning agree all historians make mistakes. But Browning points out if all the mistakes point in one direction, there is a problem. And all of Irving's errors point in the same direction, anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. The next witness for the defense was Professor Richard Evans, a very different man from Christopher Browning. 
he's short, he's squat, and he looks like he's looking for a fight. <laughs> um, they have a confrontation. Evans makes it quite clear in his testimony, he doesn't trust Irving at all. And Evans had written a 700 page report in which he found that Irving had lied about distorted and misrepresented history. He said that Irving had perpetrated a historical fraud. Now remember, to this point, Irving had made his living as a military historian, so this was destroying him. The antagonism between these two men continued. It was like there was an electric current arching between them. Evans ripped apart Irving's book about the bombing of Dresden. So let's have a picture of the bombing of Dresden's aftermath. Now, we all understand in the bombing of Germany during the Second World War, there are a lot of uh, supposedly innocent civilians that were killed, that's true. And one of the things that historians that are pro-Nazi like Irving tried to bring out is Dresden. Dresden was a beautiful city. It had no military value, um, it's fair to say. And it was bombed in January of 45. Oh, I'm sorry, it's right here, February 45. Well, Irving purports that a quarter of a million German civilians were killed. And Evans, who went through great lengths to prove that really only about 20,000 were killed. Now, I, I don't want to get into a debate about the wisdom of bombing German civilians, but unfortunately, we have to understand that the Germans, they are the ones who started. They bombed Rotterdam and, and then the British cities, London and so forth. I think we often forget, uh, I would recommend the uh, new Churchill book that's the best seller. Uh, um, uh, anyways, it, it relates to uh, the bombings of London and so forth. I think we've forgotten. 30,000 people, I think, were killed in London in the various bombings. Again and again, Evans highlights statements and language that Irving had twisted and distorted for the purpose of exonerating Hitler. The judge intervenes, and the judge Gray says, I have to decide what a sensible, objective historian would make all of this. Finally, they actually almost have to physically separate the two people, Evans and Irving. Evans was excused from the witness stand. Then they bring in a German historian, Peter Longridge. And we'll have a picture of Peter Longridge. Now he's called to testify for the defense. It was then that Irving had talked about in one of his articles, the so-called cornflakes train. The cornflakes train, in November 1941, a train load of 944 Jews left Berlin for Kovno, in what is now Lithuania. And they had deciphered the German radio code, so they knew about this train. And Irving contended that this well-provisioned train was not a death train that it was simply a train conveying all of this food to Kovno. And Irving uses the contents of the cornflake train, that's what they called it, an attempt to dispel the cattle car deportation image that we all know. Longridge quickly negates Irving's entire argument. It turns out as soon as the train arrived in Kovno, the entire group of Jewish passengers, the whole almost a thousand, were all shot. So Irving's argument about not being a death train were quickly drowned out. He was stymied. He dropped the, that subject. The long trial is finally starting to come to an end. Rampton realized the length of the trial had worn everyone down, but he wants to revitalize everyone. Rampton is an absolutely phenomenal uh, adjudicator. He calls, next picture, Hedjo Fink. Uh, 
And Hadjo Fink, professor of political science, University of Berlin, he discredits Irving. He paints him as an unrepented right wing extremist. Professor had five videos of Irving's speeches, and they allowed these videos. Funk's testimony was clearly proceeding along two lines to damage the reputation of Irving. And the first was to show that Irving wasn't just a harmless crank who gave speeches about Jews. He showed that the effects of Irving, and he, Irving, was a calculating political operator who would influence anti-Semitic sympathies against the Jews. Secondly, Funk wanted to frame the motives of Irving in his perverted historical interpretations. During one of the videos, Irving, a video of Irving's meetings, they showed dozens of marchers clearly shouting the Nazi slogan, Heil Hitler, over and over. So Rampton points all of this out and gets had to really paint Irving as an unrepentant. Up until this point, the judge, Gray, he'd been very patient, finally snapped. He says to Irving, stop picking on all this little minutia. Again, it goes back to his theory. If there's one little crack, it's okay. Focus on the main points. Thursday, May 2nd, day 29 of the trial, was the last day for David Irving to appear in the witness box. Rampton then links Irving with the British National Party. There's a far right wing. We have to remember before the war, it was actually a Nazi party. Mosley was the chief uh, leader. Somebody will remind me what, what the Nazis were called, but it was an active Nazi party in Britain before the Second World War. So Irving tries to deny his association with this extremist group, but Rampton produces a letter to Irving from the party inviting him to a regional meeting. And the letter was from Irving's own files. So Rampton is stored again. Rampton continues to pillory Irving with point after point of historical distort, dissertation as well as out and out lies. He even caught him on a significant manipulation of date. It now looks like the defense has built a solid case against the reputation and historical accuracy of Irving. When Irving is excused from the stand, Rampton rises, begins his closing arguments. There had been nine witnesses, a million and a half words of testimony. And through all of this, and again, the judge was always making scrupulous notes. And although Judge Gray had lost his patience with Irving on several occasions, he had displayed a little sign of any bias or conclusion. And we'll have another picture of the judge. Yeah, British National Party. I don't know what it was called before the war. Anyway, Rampton summarizes the lengthy proceedings. He enumerates 30 major falsifications of history by David Rubin. Rampton also gives a brief overview of the Holocaust, and he tries to put the Holocaust into the context of the Second World War. Rampton says, the evidence from both the eyewitnesses and documents was so overwhelming. Why do you, Irving, attempt to propagate the bizarre ideas of Holocaust denial? And then he simply says, Mr. Irving is an anti-Semite and a Holocaust denier. And a Holocaust denial is an expression of anti-Semitism. And he also says, Irving is a partisan of Adolf Hitler and had attempted to falsify history. Despite Rampton's strong closing arguments, we don't know what the judge is thinking. Maybe the judge is going to equivocate on Irving. Maybe he's bending over backwards to be fair. Maybe Irving is just an honest anti-Semite, I don't know what that is, who truly believes in what he produced. Some in the courtroom, which was very crowded at all times, they had paid close attention to the judge's remark. 
They were very concerned about the judgment. Irving had spoken for five hours in his closing remark. In contrast, Rampton made a very tight summation in one hour. The courtroom trial is now moved courtroom number 36 in the Royal Court of Justice, the same building, and it was here. The judgment is handed down at 10.30 in the morning, April the 11th. It was a different kind of courtroom, had high ceilings, wood paneled walls, and tall Gothic stone windows that seemed to suggest the appearance of a church. And there was a choir aloft at the rear, and it was filled with correspondence from all over the world. And as usual in London, it was raining. Deborah Lipsatz wore a somber black suit. She's surrounded by Richard Brampton, Anthony Julius, and the other members of the defense team. And just before the decision was made to be read, Irving makes his way to the seat near the jury box. Irving was wearing a blue and white striped shirt and a gray vest. And as is custom in a British trial, he should have been wearing a jacket. But on his way to court, a whole bunch of hecklers, quite frankly, threw eggs at him. So his suit jacket was all covered in eggs. So he had to appear just in a shirt invest. Finally, just Gray begins to speak. And soon the verdict was very clear. The defense of justification has succeeded. Gray continues to read his judgment for two long hours. And the final judgment was absolutely devastating to David Irving. The judge, in the next picture, please. The judge found in every stipulation but one that Irving was guilty. Irving was a Holocaust denier, a racist, an anti-Semite, and an associate of right-wing extremists. Justice Gray further concludes that with regard to Auschwitz, there was no doubt there were gas chambers and crematoriums, and hundreds of thousands of people were killed there. The judge said in an unequivocal manner there's no doubt that David Irving was an anti-Semite of the first order. And he made the strong point that Irving had repeatedly crossed the line between criticism and vilification. The judge focused on Irving's lack of historical accuracy and concluded that Irving's treatment of evidence is so perverse and so egregious egregious, that it is difficult to accept any hint of fairness or balance. If you take a history course, the one thing that they teach you, whichever way you lean in history, you have to be unbiased, you have to be balanced. History is balanced, not with respect to the Holocaust and David Irving, but you start off trying to be balanced. The judge ruled the defense will have the bulk of their costs and further refused Irving an appeal of the verdict. Irving then picks up his egg splatter jacket and leaves by a side door. The trial of the Holocaust was over and David Irving was guilty. The truth of the Holocaust came forward. Next picture, please. David Irving was a partisan of Adolf Hitler and had attempted to falsify history and the truth of the Holocaust. Thanks to the principles of Penguin Books and the steadfastness of Deborah Lipschatz was safe and even more sacrosanct. And the next picture, please. Deborah Lipschatz won the trial. David Irving continued to peddle his hatred in an epilogue, but he's now virtually penniless. And more importantly, he became a symbol of falsification, fabrication, and deception. June the 20th, 2001, he makes an attempt to gain a appeal, an appeal. The attempt failed. A panel of three high court judges ruled against Irving. The final result of the three judge panel was the appeal panel. Irving had to make a payment of 150,000 pounds towards its opponent's cost Bank, face bankruptcy. David Irving never paid. 
And perhaps the headlines in the major Jewish newspaper summed it up. The Guardian wrote, Irving is, let's have the next picture, please. This is how the cartoon in one of the British newspapers portrayed it. And the next picture, please. And as I said, the treatment of evidence is so perverse and egregious that it's difficult to accept any hint of fairness or balance. So Irving is now consigned to history as a racist lawyer. That's what the Independent called a major British newspaper. Irving is a racist, anti Semitist, and Holocaust denier, and history will judge David Irving. David Irving lost his case, and we are, can celebrate a victory for free speech. The London Times is equivalent to the New York Times. He's a racist who had twisted the truth. David Irving's reputation as a historian had absolutely been demolished. And we'll have, the, I think we have two more pictures. Next. He never paid his, the costs. And he went on to go and speak in different places, but he banned from most places. And the next picture, please. These are the headlines in the British newspaper, the Manchester Guardian, so forth. Irving is consigned to history as a racist lawyer. Then the next picture, please. And the London Times. I, and the last picture, I think it is. Truth had triumphed. Okay, uh, we've gone on for about an hour. Um, if if people would uh, raise their hands, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Anyone at all? Anybody raise? Neil, have anything? Comments? Complaints? No. Can we unmute Neil? He said something. Oh, ran into the same problem. How about now? Oh, I can hear you now. Okay, Gerald, uh, excellent. I just want to say thank you. I'm looking forward to getting back together after Yontov and a happy new year to you and to everybody else that's involved. Yeah. Thank you, Neil, for reminding me because I didn't realize I thought I wish everybody all the best. Uh, it's hard with the Zoom kind of technology, unless we're doing something like current events, to really get questions. So I don't think we can ever forget the horrors of what happened in the Second World War. And I see that we recorded this, and I hope we get a little publicity so somebody can listen. I hope I did a decent job as a lecturer. And uh, I, I want to wish you again all well. Be safe and let's all get together. And maybe at some point we can all see each other in person. All the best. Thank the you very much for tuning in. Be well, everybody. And thank you, Marnie, uh, for your great help in this series. Very thank much. you. All the best to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.